Egyptologists' discovery of an underground labyrinth that ancient humans could never build. Uh, it was underground, it had multiple levels. There's all these historical accounts of people visiting it and just being awed, like massive granite blocks and structures and temples. It's this huge thing that was just lost to the sands of time. Beneath Egypt's desert sands, something even more mysterious than the Great Pyramids has been discovered. Ancient texts described it, but for centuries, no one believed it could exist. Now, advanced technology has revealed a labyrinth so complex that it challenges everything we know about ancient engineering. It's so advanced, it may not even have been built by humans at all, and it makes us consider why such a spectacle would be hidden from the human eye for so long. For people that haven't heard of the labyrinth, it, it was one of the ancient wonders of the world. Herodotus and the Egyptian labyrinth. To understand the full extent of the labyrinth, we need to know about the first discoverers. The Greek historian Herodotus, often hailed as the father of history, offers invaluable insights into the ancient world through his detailed writings. Among his many accounts, he describes a remarkable labyrinth hidden beneath a pyramid in Egypt, a claim that has intrigued historians and archaeologists for centuries. Living in the 5th century BC, Herodotus travelled extensively through Egypt and claimed to have explored the labyrinth himself. He recounted a sprawling funerary complex composed of 3,000 rooms adorned with hieroglyphs and murals. In his book, Histories, he described the labyrinth in awe-inspiring terms. This is a work I've never seen before, a work that defies description. He compared it to Greek architecture, asserting that it surpassed even the pyramids in grandeur and complexity. Strabo, an ancient Greek historian from the 1st century BCE, also wrote of the remarkable labyrinth. He described its vast size and intricate design, emphasizing that it was built with enormous stones. They didn't look much like anything at all. Uh, much of this exterior is modern. Strabo noted that the labyrinth contains many long hidden chambers, all connected by twisting paths that weave in and out. Because of this maze-like layout, anyone attempting to navigate it would need a guide to find their way in or out of its courts. One of the most astonishing features Strabo highlighted is that each chamber's roof is made from massive single stones. These monolithic beams are so large that they span the width of the hidden passages, creating an impressive structure that relies solely on stone for support. There is no wood or other materials used at all. This combination of size, complexity and engineering marvels makes the labyrinth a true wonder of the ancient world, showcasing the incredible skills and creativity of its builders. However, these accounts do not entirely align with our modern conception of a labyrinth. Herodotus likely borrowed the term from the legendary labyrinth of Crete, designed by Daedalus to imprison the Minotaur, kind of like how today's escape rooms are designed to trap you in until you solve the puzzles. But unlike the tricky mazes we imagine, the Egyptian labyrinth was probably more like a sprawling palace complex, similar to walking through a massive shopping mall with endless hallways and rooms, but without the intention of getting lost. Over time, the idea of a labyrinth has shifted from a place meant to confuse to something grand and complex. In ancient Crete, labyrinths were expansive, often grand structures serving ceremonial or administrative purposes. Paintings depicting bull leaping, a popular sport among the Minoans, suggest that these sites were dynamic venues for cultural expression. Over the ages, various cultures have built labyrinths for myriad reasons, as ritualistic spaces, protective structures against malevolent spirits, or even as intricate designs symbolizing sacred journeys. Anthropologists Schuster and Carpenter did a study called Patterns That Connect, where they argue that labyrinths often served as sacred pathways connecting the living to the spiritual realm. For instance, in some Indian traditions, labyrinths symbolize ancestral connections, representing the bond between the living and the deceased. Such interpretations emphasize the labyrinth's role as a sanctuary for divine or ancestral figures. Modern archaeologists have long debated the existence of Herodotus's labyrinth. Skeptics initially dismissed his description as exaggerated or fictional. However, recent archaeological discoveries have sparked renewed interest. A site believed to correspond with Herodotus's accounts has been uncovered, revealing a complex of chambers that aligns with his detailed descriptions. And with them, he suspects, are vast riches, riches that may well change history. Gateway to ancient secrets. Even though recent discoveries really illuminate the existence of the labyrinth, it wasn't the only time we found clues. 
the first significant findings were uncovered by Flinders Petrie in the late 1800s, who discovered a vast stone foundation over 300 meters wide, lying four to five meters beneath the surface, about 90 kilometers south of Cairo at Hawara. He speculated that these were the remnants of the labyrinth's foundations, now long destroyed. But to truly appreciate the significance of the labyrinth in both architecture and archaeology, we first need to examine the area surrounding it, starting with the Hawara Pyramid and the remarkable features within. Today, we recognize this remarkable site as Hawara, named after the nearby village. This pyramid marks the entrance to the Fayum Oasis, a vast depression that is beautifully highlighted by the lush green area surrounding it. At the northern edge of this oasis lies Lake Moeris. However, these floods could also displace countless numbers of Egyptians. A shimmering body of water that adds to the area's charm and allure. The Fayum Oasis is a vital oasis in Egypt, known for its fertile land and historical significance, making this pyramid a gateway to one of the country's most captivating landscapes. Today, the pyramid might appear as a mere mound of dark mud, but beneath that lies an ancient core made of high-quality megalithic stone. Here, we find a fascinating contrast between two distinct technologies, a beautifully dressed stone core hidden beneath a layer of mud bricks. Currently, this site is suffering from flooding caused by groundwater saturated with salt, which is damaging the once smooth surfaces and obstructing the entrance passage. However, the craftsmanship of the entrance masonry is truly impressive. The blocks fit together with remarkable precision. Uh, it's rich beyond belief for me because it's done and, and I actually worked something out. This discovery is even more intriguing when we consider what was first uncovered in the 18th century. Petrie noted that the stone casing had been removed during Roman times, which contributed to the structure's degradation since the core was made of mud bricks that had crumbled over time. It remains uncertain whether this pyramid was originally intended to be man-made. When Petri searched for the entrance on the north side, he found nothing. It became clear that the design of this pyramid was quite different from any others known at that time. The entrance was located at ground level on the south side, near the southwest corner. Unlike traditional pyramids, the descending passage was uniquely designed, featuring steps flanked by ramps. This design closely resembles findings made by alternative history researchers studying the Black Pyramid. The ramps suggest that this passage might have been meant for transporting cargo on wheeled carts. Ancient architectural marvels. As excavations continued in the pyramid, a complex network of passages was uncovered, complete with sliding trap doors. There are three known trap doors in this structure, each weighing around 20 tons, likely the lightest in the entire complex. Interestingly, Petri discovered that none of these trap doors had been slid shut, they remained open. He noted that while searching for a pathway to a burial chamber, he found no door because the entrance had been sealed by a massive block that had been lowered into place. To gain access, workers had to chip away a hole in the hard sandstone roof, allowing them to reach the chamber. The chamber itself is a marvel, carved nearly entirely from a single block of hard quartzite sandstone, creating a vast tank for the sarcophagus. This intricate craftsmanship highlights the incredible engineering skills of ancient builders and sets the stage for the other mysteries that the labyrinth may hold. What transpired was a remarkable feat of engineering. Workers dug into the solid rock formed from hardened sand to create a central hollow or pit designed to hold the sarcophagus chamber. Into this newly excavated space, they carefully lowered a massive quartzite monolith weighing over 110 tons and shaped precisely to serve as the sarcophagus chamber. Once this enormous structure was in place, the sarcophagus itself, along with two accompanying chests, was placed inside it. They also cut trenches that would later form the passages leading to this grand chamber. On top of this impressive structure, horizontal slabs of stone were laid to create a kind of roof. Petrie, the noted archaeologist, believed these passages were not meant to mislead treasure hunters, but served a clever purpose in the design. To close off the chamber, the last massive quartzite slab was lowered into position. This was accomplished by using sand to support the stone as it descended, which allowed the huge piece to be gradually lowered into place via side tunnels. Above this layer, a third roof was constructed from slanting beams of limestone, 
each weighing around 55 tons. The exact reasoning behind this design choice remains uncertain. When the massive carved stone box was set into the hollow in the rock, the entire structure resembled a fortified stone vault. Petrie provided detailed observations about the megalithic quartzite tank inside the chamber. He described it as being seven meters long, two meters wide, and two meters high, with walls nearly a meter thick. The craftsmanship was remarkable. The sides were smooth and uniform, with such sharply defined inner corners that he couldn't detect any joints upon close inspection. The surface was so polished that the hard, flinty sandstone reflected the flickering light of his candle beautifully. Interestingly, he noted that there were no inscriptions on the walls or the sarcophagi. If not for the funeral items found inside, even the name of the pharaoh would have remained lost. It's quite puzzling that a pharaoh would not leave behind a name in such a grand tomb after creating such a magnificent space. A great brick arch was constructed over the entire masonry of the chamber, with bricks from the pyramid piled on top, showcasing the incredible ingenuity of the builders. Now, the crucial part is that there's no way into the sarcophagus room. This burial chamber is covered by three massive slabs made of tough quartzite sandstone, each over 1.2 meters thick and extending well beyond the walls of the chamber on either side. The original entrance was sealed off when one of these colossal slabs, weighing around 45 tons, was lowered into position. This means that the only time the pharaoh's mummy could have been placed inside was during the pyramid's construction, which seems quite strange. No remains of bodies or coffins were found in the sarcophagi. In fact, all that Flinders Petrie discovered were a few charred bone fragments, along with pieces of charcoal and grains of burned diorite. It was clear that whatever once filled the sarcophagus had been made from wood adorned with polished stones. Intriguingly, it appears that whatever was inside this sarcophagus in ancient times was set ablaze for some unknown reason right there in the chamber, while the main sarcophagus sits proudly in the center of the room. Some people telling you, oh, that was only during the older times that they... No, they were working with granite. The second one clearly came later, added after the pyramid was built, when it was too difficult to transport larger stones. It would be fascinating to examine the craftsmanship of these two sarcophagi and see how they compare. But the secrets of the Hawara Pyramid do not end here. There are hidden passageways leading to other incredible underground structures, a wonder lost to time. By the late 17th century, interest in the labyrinth was peaked even among the great leaders of the world particularly during Napoleon Bonaparte's famous expedition to Egypt at the turn of the 19th century. Napoleonic scholars documented their observations, but their efforts offered little concrete evidence of the labyrinth's existence. Upon Petri's arrival, he encountered a site ravaged by extensive quarrying and looting, which he assumed to have been done by Napoleon's people. The casing stones of the nearby pyramid had long since vanished leaving behind a landscape scarred by history. Nevertheless, Petrie was determined to excavate the depths of the labyrinth, focusing on the Greek-Roman structures that had been built atop it. Nearby, a cemetery emerged, a testament to the burial practices during the later Egyptian and Ptolemaic periods, with tombs constructed directly over the labyrinth's remains. His excavations revealed an extensive network of chambers and corridors, a portion of which remains inaccessible today due to the elevated water table. His meticulous documentation of the area provided some of the first modern evidence of the labyrinth's existence, igniting renewed interest in the site. In a reflective note penned in 1889, Petrie wrote, this site, named from the village of Hawara nearby, was the principal ground for my excavations during 1888. The most ancient subject for our attention then is the site of the labyrinth by all authors. He noted the proximity of the labyrinth to the pyramid, emphasizing that Hawara was the only pyramid located between the mouth of the canal and Arsinoe. Petri measured the area, discovering an expanse littered with limestone chips, remnants of what was once a grand structure. However, he lamented the loss of beauty and magnificence, stating that nearly every stone had been broken and removed. Despite this, Petrie's excavations uncovered a bed of flat-laid sand and beaten stone chips, suggesting that an immense building once lay above them. Upon tracing these markings to their farthest edges, researchers discovered that they span an impressive area of about 1,000 feet long and 800 feet wide. While these numbers may seem abstract, they don't fully capture the immense scale of the construction. To better understand this size, 
we can compare it to some of the greatest temples of ancient Egypt. This space could easily accommodate the entire Great Hall of Karnak, along with all the adjoining temples, the expansive courtyard, and the majestic pylons that define it. Moreover, it could fit the Temple of Mert, the Temple of Khonsu, and the Temple of Amenhotep III, all located at Karnak, as well as the two grand temples of Luxor. Remarkably, there would still be enough room for the entire Ramesseum. Essentially, every temple east of Thebes, along with one of the largest temples on the West Bank, could be placed within the ruins at Hawara. Clearly, this site deserves the legendary status that the labyrinth is known for. Despite sifting through a significant portion of this sandy expanse and carefully examining every piece of stone, Petrie found only a few fragments of worked and inscribed granite at this location. These remnants, likely the pillared columns still visible today, offer just a hint of the splendor that once thrived here. Unearthing the Labyrinth In 10 years digging in Egypt, Petrie reflects on his remarkable findings at Hawara, shedding light on the grandeur of this ancient site. As Petrie began his excavations, he quickly uncovered evidence that shifted the narrative. His work revealed that the brick chambers, initially thought to be part of the labyrinth, were merely remnants of a village, built atop the ruins of a much larger stone structure. This realization was pivotal. It showcased the complexity of the site and the misconceptions that had surrounded it. Beneath the more recent brick constructions lay a vast expanse of stone chips, so immense that even seasoned visitors struggled to accept that these were remnants of human activity rather than a natural formation. Petrie meticulously documented these layers. We're stuffed lots of limestone chippings mixed with a huge dollops of mortar. Noting a remarkable six foot thick stratum of chips that hinted at an extraordinary architectural endeavor. Beneath this chaotic array of fragments was a uniformly smooth bed of beaten plaster serving as the foundation for the ancient buildings. This discovery was crucial as it illustrated the sophistication of the engineering techniques employed by the builders. The canal that had cut across the site revealed further secrets. Where it intersected, the mass of stone chips abruptly ceased, marking the boundaries of the long-lost structure. While no clear signs of its architectural design have emerged to definitively link this remarkable structure to the legendary labyrinth, its sheer size indicates it far surpassed any temple known in Egypt. Ancient historians like Pliny noted that for centuries, this labyrinth served as a major quarry for the region so much so that a small town sprang up around the masons who worked there. All this information aligns closely with what we can uncover today, leaving little doubt that we stand on the site of one of Egypt's great wonders. To envision the labyrinth's grandeur, Petrie turned to ancient writings about the site. He painted a picture of a vast complex filled with enormous halls, open courts, and chambers adorned with impressive columns, showcasing both peristyle and hypostyle designs. Each court could rival the immense temples of Luxor and Karnak, which continue to attract millions of visitors each year. In the end, however, Petri concluded that little remained of the structure itself. It had been so thoroughly quarried that only its remnants lingered, leaving us with just the echoes of those ancient accounts to imagine its former glory. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. Dr. Ilara Foster wiped the dust from her forehead as the last piece of sand was brushed away. The team had been working for weeks, mapping the Hawara site, but nothing could have prepared them for what lay beneath. As the ground-penetrating radar lit up the screen, it became clear there was a labyrinth deep underground, far more intricate than any previously known structure, Dr. Foster gasped. This is impossible, whispered her colleague Ahmed, eyes wide. Egyptologists discovered a labyrinth underground ancient humans could never build. The chamber stretched for miles, with walls that seemed to shimmer under their torchlight. Geometrically perfect, the walls were made from a material unlike anything seen before, pulsating faintly with a strange energy. This can't be, Alara murmured, running her hand over the smooth surface. It's as if the labyrinth was carved by something non-human. They ventured deeper, their path illuminated by the glow of the walls. Symbols, not of any known civilization, adorned every corner. At the center of the labyrinth, they found a massive door, pulsing like a heartbeat. What could be behind this? Ahmed asked, his voice trembling. Ilara stared at the door, her heart racing. This discovery defied everything they knew about human history. If ancient humans didn't build this, she whispered, then who did? And more importantly, if they opened that door, would they be ready for what they might find on the other side? 
secrets beneath the sands. Now we go back to today's discoveries, exciting new technologies have opened up incredible possibilities for researchers exploring the Hawara site, far beyond what Flinders Petrie could have imagined. Using ground-penetrating radar and other advanced tools, archaeologists can now look beneath the Earth's surface without disturbing the ancient ruins. One such expedition, the Mataha Expedition in 2008, involved a team of geophysicists who employed radar technology to examine the area below what Patry had identified as the labyrinth's foundation. What they uncovered was nothing short of astounding, a sprawling network of walls and chambers hidden deep underground. Their discoveries suggested that what Petri thought was the base of the labyrinth might actually be its roof, indicating that the true structure could still lie buried below. The radar scans revealed a complex grid of rooms and passageways at depths between 8 to 12 meters, confirming the existence of a gigantic structure that matched the vivid descriptions recorded by ancient historians. However, despite the excitement surrounding these findings, they faced unexpected challenges. Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, led by the prominent archaeologist Zahi Hawass, requested that the results remain confidential, citing national security concerns. The Mataha team encountered numerous delays and obstacles, but after two years of perseverance, they were finally able to publish their findings. Now, this is the clincher, and whatever anybody says about what I'm telling you here, they say, oh, that's all rubbish, they never did this. These revelations supported ancient accounts of a labyrinth far larger than any known temple in Egypt, a massive structure that had been concealed beneath the sands for thousands of years. Some researchers speculated it could have served as a secret repository, a hidden space for storing valuable artifacts or knowledge. Others proposed that it might have functioned as a ceremonial or religious center, designed with twisting corridors and chambers to both amaze and bewilder those who dared to enter. One of the most fascinating things about the labyrinth is how old it seems to be. Its structure is tilted by 20 to 25 degrees compared to the nearby Hawara Pyramid, hinting that it might be much older than the pyramid itself. We are standing on a sort of design lab. This is where they controlled the architecture of the pyramid. If this is correct, it opens up exciting possibilities. The labyrinth could have been built long before the pharaohs, serving as a remnant of a civilization that came before. Even with modern technology at our fingertips, many mysteries about the labyrinth still linger. The underground chambers are far from fully explored, and we have no idea what treasures or ancient writings might be hidden inside. Could the labyrinth still hold artifacts from a time long ago? Might it contain clues about the origins of the Egyptians? Now, this angle has to be so precise because if you're a wee, wee fraction of a degree out... Or even earlier cultures that once thrived in the area. The silent battle for Hawara. In 2010, two years after a groundbreaking discovery at Hawara, Egypt, a website emerged, shining a light on the secrets lying beneath the sands. This initiative, led by the esteemed Dr. Zahi Hawass, aimed to share insights from the Mataha expedition. The expedition's results indicated that geophysical research confirmed the presence of archaeological features across several hectares south of the Hawara pyramid. The data revealed vertical walls with an average thickness of several meters, suggesting the existence of numerous enclosed spaces. However, the path to public acknowledgement was fraught with challenges. Undeterred, the team decided to take a stand, posting their conclusions on the now-defunct Labyrinth of Egypt.com website. They aim to combat the silence surrounding their groundbreaking discoveries and to advocate for the preservation and study of the site. The urgency for action was underscored in the expedition's recommendations for further ground-scanning surveys. At this, I feel so insignificant and immediate improvements to the drainage system at Hawara. The corrosive salty water threatening the site's integrity was a pressing concern. The hope was that by addressing these issues, large-scale excavations could eventually commence, transforming Hawara from a relatively obscure archaeological site into a prominent tourist destination, on par with the renowned sites of Giza and Saqqara. There are even a few intriguing documentaries on the subject including one narrated by Brendan Fraser called Egypt What Lies Beneath, which aired on the Discovery Channel a couple of years ago. This technology combines infrared scanning 
with high-definition photography, but it only works at shallow depths and is most effective in dry conditions, like those found in deserts. To fit the other, a bit like a jigsaw puzzle if you like. It's precise, intricate work, but there was also... In 2015, Carmen Bolter, an independent researcher and filmmaker known for her The Pyramid Code documentaries, made a striking claim during a podcast. Alongside Klaus Dohner, an author and researcher with access to advanced space-based archaeological technology, they mapped the area around Hawara. Their findings suggested that they had discovered significant parts of the legendary labyrinth, or at least many underground chambers and passageways. According to their results, these structures appeared in various layers at different depths, stretching over a wide area to the south of the pyramid. Dr. Bolter even mentioned that they detected the presence of gold beneath the ground at Hawara. Klaus Dohner has several online lectures discussing this technology, often concerning the so-called Bosnian pyramids. He mentions a friend in Germany who developed this scanning technology. In another lecture, Klaus Dohner explained that this technology can reach depths of up to 6,000 meters below the surface. A few months ago, I began collaborating with a very good friend in Germany who invented a new technology, a technology that allows us to scan through the earth even as deep as 6,000 meters, he stated. This remarkable capability could open new doors in our understanding of ancient structures and their mysteries. These claims are definitely intriguing, but without solid data or clear details about the technology or scientific proof supporting them, it's hard to confirm their accuracy. It's not that they're necessarily incorrect, but extraordinary claims require equally extraordinary evidence to support them. More information about the tests and the technology behind them would be very welcome, as it would help make sense of these assertions. So far, however, most of the available information comes from lectures and podcasts, many of which are from around five years ago. Could these astonishing underground structures at Hawara be the work of a lost advanced civilization or do they challenge everything we know about the engineering capabilities of ancient humans? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below.